Hi, my name is Brendan Radabaugh, and I will be your host for the Orlando Regional Workshop Series. Thank you to the Orange County government for sponsoring this series. I'm here with Dan Swando today. What are we going to be talking about? Well, we're going to be talking about drivetrain strategy and making it simple. And what is your background in FIRST Robotics? Well, I started in FIRST Robotics in uh, 1999 as part of uh, the Rookie Team 217. Uh, and I've been in FIRST ever since. Uh, I have a, a professional engineering license, uh, a, a degree, and a, a professional management certificate. OK. And if you would like to get your presentation started, you can. Thanks, Brandon. All right. <clears throat> so uh, as I said, my name is Dan Swando. Uh, and we're going to be talking about how drivetrain fits into your strategy. Uh, so uh, what a lot of teams end up doing is uh, they, they want to rush into playing the game, uh, scoring the most points and everything. Uh, but they don't put a lot of time thinking about the drivetrain, which is actually going to be how you end up playing the game most successfully. Uh, and, and if you don't have the right drivetrain, then you're not going to be able to play the game as efficiently uh, as you want to. So you got to first think of how your drivetrain fits into how your uh, game piece interaction is going to go. Can you pick up your uh, scoring objects off the floor? Uh, are you going to want to pick up things behind you or in front of you? Uh, you also have to consider trade-offs for your drivetrain such as uh, traction or speed. Do you want to be a fast robot? Or do you want to be able to push other robots around or stop uh, other robots from pushing you around? Uh, you got to worry about your center of gravity and make sure that you don't tip over, uh, either when you're playing, playing the game or if you're being defended against. And you also have to think about how autonomous mode fits into your strategy. Uh, drivetrain is, is a difficult thing. Uh, because it ends up being designed uh, after you figure out how you want to play the game, but you need to build it first. Uh, it needs to be the most reliable part of your robot. You need to design for contact to be played uh, defense against. Uh, you need to be robust, and uh, especially you need to uh, design your drivetrain to be very well maintained and to maintain it really fast. Uh, you don't want to be caught in the middle uh, between matches and have to uh, fix your drivetrain. <clears throat> uh, it, it's totally OK to reuse your drivetrain design from year to year. Uh, you, you can use your commercial off-the-shelf components, uh, reusing and recycling. It's perfectly OK to do that. Uh, if you have the ability. It's definitely good to uh, build two drivetrains, one to test and drive with, and one to build. But whichever you choose and whichever way you plan to do it, most importantly, uh, in order to do it right, you need to make it reliable. So uh, there's so many different combinations you need to think about when you're doing your drivetrain. Uh, so I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, but first of all, let's uh, do a little math on how many, uh, you, you know, how, how impossible this choice is. You, uh, you've got multiple different configurations of your drivetrain. You can uh, have it uh, four-wheel drive, six-wheel drive. Uh, you can have mechanum wheels, West Coast uh, car steering, uh, crab drive. Uh, you, what, what size are your wheels? Are you going to use four inches, six inch, eight inch wheels? Uh, what, what materials your wheels can be made of? Aluminum, plastic. Both of them have their advantages or disadvantages. Then you have your different tread material on, on your wheels. Uh, you, you can have rubber, rubber tread, uh, uh, plastic tread, all, all different kinds of tread. Uh, are you going to have hard or soft material? And, and then what is your gear ratios? Suddenly you're into 20,000 plus different combinations. Uh, so, so and you can't possibly think of all of these on day one. So uh, you, you, let's make it as simple as possible. So let's start with where you get your drivetrain components from. Uh, the main uh, vendors that 
uh, support first robotics, uh, specifically for drivetrain, uh, that there's a few big players. Uh, first of all, there's Andy Mark. Uh, Andy Mark uh, was started by a couple of first robotics mentors. Uh, they, uh, they actually started off creating the first kit bot for rookie teams and, and young teams. And uh, from there, they've, they've uh, really taken off. Uh, they, they're responsible for building a lot of the field components. Uh, and uh, they, they have a number of uh, sponsored teams and other initiatives, uh, such as Robot in Three Days, and, uh, and, and partnerships with other groups uh, and other vendors. Uh, another vendor that's frequently used is VEX. Uh, they, they actually were one of first's uh, first uh, vendors uh, all the way back in 96. They, they actually invented the original control system or one of the original control systems for first. Uh, they, they invented VEX uh, and they also mentor uh, and, uh, and support a lot of first teams. And then another one that I want to mention is uh, Rev Ro Robotics. Uh, this is a relatively uh, newer uh, uh, vendor to, to FIRST, uh, but also started by a couple of FIRST uh, alumni in Texas. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about some of their components as well. So a brief history of drivetrains in the FIRST Robotics competition. Uh, for, for reference, you can, you can pick up the book. I, I highly recommend picking up the book Behind the Design if you can uh, uh, find it on online. It's a good book that tells you uh, a lot of uh, different uh, robotic ideas throughout the throughout the years. Uh, but in 1998 or about, we we had our first uh, swerve drive. Uh, Team 47, Chief Delphi, they uh, uh, they they put together a, a, a swerve drive uh, that would make their robot uh, turn very, very easily. Uh, they, they called it crab steer. It, 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 uh, it, it evolved, and they, they were able to come up with a very elegant design. Uh, in 2002, we, we started getting into shifting. Uh, the Technocats really started that uh, in, in 2002, uh, and uh, the, the mentors, Andy, and Mark uh, ended up starting Andy Mark. So it's uh, clear to see uh, where you get a lot of that inno innovation at Andy Mark from. Um, and then we, we, we always had a lot of trouble with drivetrains in the early years of FIRST. So different teams would come up with completely innovative ways of fixing the drivetrain problem. Uh, so in, in 04, uh, they, they actually, a, a team, uh, again, Chief Delphi, actually started using DeWalt drills, uh, uh, the ends of DeWalt drill transmissions and sticking them on motors. And, and that was their drive train, and they used that all over their robot. Uh, and then in 2005, uh, right around when Andy Mark started, that's when we really entered uh, a new era for first robotics where it set a new standard of what a basic robot could look like uh, between the, the kit bot and the, the kit transmissions, which originally were the tough boxes and, and have evolved since then. Uh, and, uh, and, and that really started this new era where you didn't really have to completely design your drivetrain from scratch. You could actually just pick it out of components that you can either get out of the kit of parts or from some of these vendors. So let's talk about some of these configurations that we've been talking about. So uh, you, can, you, you can see uh, there's, there's quite a different array of robot designs you can have for your uh, drivetrain, uh, depending on how many wheels you have. Uh, and how you use the wheels. You can uh, have standard skid steer, uh, either four-wheel drive or six-wheel drive, or even expand that to a tank, which is a, a bit inefficient. 
uh, but uh, for for most most games, but can really serve its purpose if if you got a a a game that really needs it. Um, then then we have special wheels such as Omni wheels or what are known as Mechanum wheels, and those allow your robot to strafe back and forth and. Uh, I, I like to think of it as uh, browsing through shelves. So you can you can sidestep your robot as as you're going along the shelves, picking uh, objects up or 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 scoring them uh, both laterally as well as uh, uh, um, forward and, and reverse. Uh, and then and then you've got the different steering uh, mechanisms, which. Uh, you, you can have two-wheel steer or four-wheel steer, but uh, I think with most of the first robotics games, uh, you, you end up uh, being best off if, if you're going to want to be very maneuverable. Instead of using a, a active steering, uh, you can use your mechanum uh, drive, or, or if not, there's really nothing wrong with the six-wheel drive. Uh, standard uh, stid, a skid steer a robot because that will uh, be able to play most of the games uh, that you need. So uh, overall, there's really no way to go wrong here. Uh, the, the standard drive configuration usually involves uh, around four uh, SIM motors uh, in in, uh, and a gearbox that, that interfaces with them. In the, in the kit, you have the, the Tough Box Mini or, or a, a similar gearbox. Uh, and then you have the sprockets that attach your, your transmissions to the wheels. Um, you can use four wheel or six wheel, or four inch or six inch wheels uh, for your six wheel uh, drive. Uh, it really depends on how high you want your center of gravity and how you plan on playing the game. Uh, so if, if you do a little uh, math and calculation, you find out if you have four inch wheels, you have a robot that will go around eight and a half feet per second. But if you go up to a six inch wheel, you can get your robot to go uh, almost 13 feet per second. And really, that's uh, the, the the majority of robots will fall within that range. Uh, you typically won't have robots going much, much faster than, than that because then you end up losing a lot of control uh, uh, unless, uh, of course, they, they have a, a shifting uh, style transmission. We'll go into that. So uh, first, let's talk about wheels. Uh, as I said, the, the typical wheels are, are either four inch or six inch. Sometimes they can go up to, to eight inch wheels depending on uh, the game and, and how it needs to be played. Uh, but it's really a, uh, a, a trade off of, of speed versus torque. Um, you know, the, the larger wheels will give you, give you a bigger speed and they might actually even help you with, with uh, traction, but you're going to give, uh, give up a little bit of your pushing force that you would have on your uh, four inch wheels. Uh, as I mentioned, obstacles are, are very important to consider when you're talking, uh, when, when you're considering the wheels and uh, what, what your surface is going to look like. Is it, uh, are you primarily going to be driving on the carpet or is there different uh, floor surfaces that you're going to need to drive on that may require something a little bit different? So here's a, a bunch of different uh, options that you can use. My personal uh, uh, preference is uh, use what works. Uh, in in our, our vendors uh, catalog, you can use the rubber treads. The rubber treads work really well if you need some traction. Uh, the rough top material also works really well. Um, but if you want, uh, and, and you get good traction and maneuverability out of those. If you want really good maneuverability and you don't care as 
much about traction or getting pushed around, uh, then definitely look into the, the Mechanum wheels for, for that. So uh, now we're getting into motors. And typically, when you're looking at motors, you're, you're going to look at uh, one of these kind of charts. And, and this chart uh, is called a motor curve. And it shows you, it, it really guides you towards what, ro uh, what motor is going to work out best for you. <clears throat> and, and it's read very simply um, that you know, as, as your uh, torque goes up, your speed goes down. And so you have this nice little curve. Uh, and, and everybody knows that you have a, either a 20 amp or a 30 amp breaker according to the rules for, for, uh, uh, for, for motor usage uh, or 40 amps for the uh, sim motors. And so uh, in order to figure out what your, uh, what, what your um, your ultimate speed and torque will be. Uh, you, you look at where that breaker uh, line uh, connects with, uh, with, with your torque and your speed, and you know exactly where your, uh, what, what kind of torque will trip your breaker if, uh, if you're pushing it too hard. But fortunately, uh, there's a lot of literature out there for first teams to be able to do you know, be able to just look it up without having to uh, go through the uh, the motor tables, um, and and so uh, as you can see here, um, the the sim motor is uh, really the, the the gold standard for uh, for power. Uh, you, you get the most uh, watts for 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 your motor and uh, for for a standard drivetrain, you'll end up using four of those uh, for uh, for your robot. So you'll be uh, you'll have up to uh, you know potentially 1,200 watts of of power on your drivetrain, which is uh, quite a lot. Now it doesn't actually end up being that high because of of how you gear down your your robot, but um, Usually, the, the rule of thumb is the higher the, the wattage of motor, the, the better, uh, more power that you're going to be able to use out of that motor. So um, here's, here's a couple of other motors. They're, they're kind of specialized. The ones I want to point out are, uh, are the Neo brushless motors. Brushless motors are good uh, for feedback. You can actually get a lot of information uh, from feedback control from these brushless motors. Um, they're, they're a bit more expensive than normal motors, but uh, Rev uh, Robotics actually has, has them and they've integrated them into a lot of their products. And uh, they work really well for uh, a lot of those applications. And then the other motor, uh, isn't really for a drivetrain motor, but it's one that's frequently used in robotics, uh, which is a window motor. Uh, you, can, you can see that it's not as powerful as the other motors on this list, but uh, it's got a really good uh, speed for, uh, at only 74 RPM, it's really good for uh, arms, uh, arm control, or, or what other uh, mechanisms you might put on your robot. Um, so, tr transmissions. Once you've selected your uh, motors, you got to uh, understand how your uh, transmissions are going to translate that power from the motors to your drivetrain. Uh, again, the the big consideration is speed versus torque. Uh, are you going to shift your your drivetrain? Uh, or are you going to have multiple speeds or, or just have one speed? Uh, but the, the other big important consideration is maintenance. Uh, you, you really want to pick a transmission that doesn't need to be maintained a lot. Uh, but if it does break or, or if something happens to it, you can maintain it really quickly. Because uh, the worst thing uh, that can happen is uh, being, being caught in the final matches and your drivetrain breaks down 
and now you can't play the game uh, at, at all without a functional drivetrain. Uh, form factor for your transmissions, how does it fit into your robot and how does uh, your, you know, how, how, how does it fit within your robot's uh, envelope and, uh, and how is it going to get in the way with all the other uh, components that you want to put on the robot to play the game? And then lastly, uh, cost and, and the weight of transmissions is also important. Uh, so uh, here's a couple of different uh, types of transmissions. And your, your drivetrain is probably going to use uh, a couple of them uh, paired together. You're, you're most likely going to have a chain and a belt or, or, or spur gears uh, driving your drivetrain. Um, and and what, what we're trying to do here for the transmissions is uh, take the very high speed that the motors are putting out and bring them down into a more manageable uh, speed that the wheels can spin at uh, and, and give us more torque. So in order to figure that out, you've got an equation, the, the, the bigger uh, gear N2 divided by the smaller gear N, N1. Uh, the math's pretty simple here. Uh, um, so, so you're you're probably going to use one of these uh, first couple of uh, transmissions in in your drivetrain. Uh, another type is a worm gear, which is more for linear motion, uh, and and or changing direction of of your motion uh, between uh, two directions. Uh, planetary gears, you're, you're most likely going to use one of those in your transmission. Uh, and I'll go into a couple of different ones that are on the market. And, and bevel gear, again, is used for, for changing direction of your motion as well. So here's a couple of uh, 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 different planetary gear transmissions uh, between uh, your your Bainbot uh, transmissions. Uh, Andy Mark has some planetary gear sets. Uh, Versa planetary and, and Rev has an ultra planetary even for for their motors. And really, the the important takeaway from here is there there's really a a planetary gear set uh, for for every application, and you get really good gear ratios from these planetary gear sets. Uh, so, so you can get uh, uh, around uh, anywhere from from four to one up to over almost two hundred to one, or or even beyond, uh, and it'll give you really good trade off on on torque um, um, with with the sacrifice of speed. So. Uh, Here's some other different tr transmissions. Uh, these use multiple motors. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the Toughbox or the Toughbox Mini, uh, th those are the, the standard uh, transmissions. And you, you still have a lot of uh, options when it comes to different uh, uh, gear ratios that you can use uh, to, to trade off your, your speed and your torque. So. Uh, again, there, there's lots of options, and, and the important thing is just use what works best for your team, and and don't try to be fancy or or complicated uh, when when you just want to keep it simple and and get on to playing the game. Uh, an, one other thing that I'd like to point out is uh, the the nanotubes uh, is is a very interesting uh, transmission design. And, and it's pretty heavy, uh, and, and that's this, uh, the, the one on the far right in, in the middle. Um, but it also acts as part of your robot frame, so that you, you get the trade-off, uh, that you get more structure out of your transmission, and you don't have to build additional structure around your uh, drivetrain. So it's all, all built right in. So 
that's also uh, kind of handy. Um, and, and lastly, we, we have some uh, different uh, shifting transmissions. Uh, if, if you do need to have two different speeds, uh, in my experience, it's not usually, the game's usually not uh, the kind of game that you need a shifting uh, transmission. Uh, you, you can definitely play the game without it in, in 99 times out of 100. Um, but if, if uh, your team comes up with a really good idea that needs a shifting transmission, you might end up uh, using one of, one of these designs. Um, and uh, one, one interesting uh, thing is uh, sometimes with the uh, shifting transmissions, you can u do what's known as a power takeoff. Uh, and uh, what, what that means is if, if your robot, uh, the goal of your robot is to hang from a, a, a bar uh, up high, you can use your drivetrain as a winch and uh, do a power takeoff into driving that winch uh, and, and, and climbing up the bar. Um, so that, that's one advantage to this design. Uh, there, there's, a, there, there's really a lot of different options when it comes to motors and transmissions. And I'm not going to go into every which one, but the, the idea that I want to show is that there's, there's really any possible combination that you can think of. Uh, but but don't get overwhelmed with all the options. Just keep to uh, the simple simple things that fit your robot the best. So, in overall, uh, working it backwards, let's look at our standard design. If we're using, if if we've said that we want four sim motors uh, with uh, these sprockets, and oh, by the way, these the, the sprockets that you use on your transmission and your wheels, you've got a lot of options for, for changing your gear ratios there, too. And if you want to change it on the fly, uh, having a couple of extra sprockets that give you different gear ratios, that's definitely uh, one of your best plans on, on, on doing that. Uh, if we have a four inch wheel, uh, then we do our calculations and, and we find out that our needed ratio uh, ends up being around eight and a half feet per second. Then uh, we know that we can use our tough box, which is about uh, eight and a half to one gear ratio. So uh, the math is, is pretty simple. Uh, there, there's really no wrong way to build a dri drivetrain. Uh, as I said, you, you, you have to take it in with everything else that you want your robot to do. Uh, but you definitely need your drivetrain to be the first thing that you build. Uh, and, and you want to build it quickly so that your uh, team can test it, your, your electronics team can, can wire it, and your drivers can start driving on with it. And then you can move on to uh, how you're going to manipulate the game pieces and, and prototyping that. Uh, whichever way you choose, mostly important. Uh, in order to do it right, you got to make it reliable. Uh, if you can make two of them, then you can practice with one while you're prototyping on the other. Um, you really need to uh, consider the, the trade-off between speed and torque. Uh, and, and have very durable wheels in order to uh, accomplish that. Uh, you need to consider what motors are available uh, to your team and, and which ones you're, you're going to use. Uh, and, and lastly, for transmissions, you want to make sure that they're maintainable uh, during, during the competition. And you need to consider uh, how they fit into your robot and and all the other things. 
All right. Well, that's it for my presentation. Uh, I think uh, Brendan's going to ha have uh, some questions. So um, for your presentation, what would be your favorite gear train configuration? Uh, as, as far as transmissions or the overall Transmissions, how many wheels, how many? Well, I, I really like the uh, omni-wheel configuration. Uh, my favorite uh, variation on that is where you have a drop-down uh, uh, omni-wheel configuration. So normally you can you, you just have your four-wheel or six-wheel drive, and then if you need to, you, you drop down that middle section, and then you can slide over from side to side. OK. I've tried to make one of those before. Didn't work out. It doesn't. It's, it's very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, and then does the robot have to be square or rectangle? No. Uh, actually, the, some of the more successful robots I've seen have been hexagon-shaped. Uh, or, or cir you know, semi-circular. It's hard to make a fully circular robot. But um, uh, there, there's a lot of robots that if, if uh, you, you build your upper part of your robot correctly and, and you've got a turret or something, it really doesn't matter what your bottom ends up looking like. Cause, you know, th there's some teams that they, they don't know which way is front. There, there really is no front of the robot. Mm -hmm. So it's with the custom robots, would you recommend new teams? Would you recommend using the kitbot frame or making their own custom frame? Yeah, no, you, you can get really successful with the kitbot frame. Uh, as, as I've shown, most of the teams will end up being very competitive uh, with a kitbot frame. Really, the, the important thing is getting that frame put together with the kitbot chassis and then moving on to manipulating the game pieces very well and that's how you're going to be able to compete with the uh, the, the more experienced teams and a lot of times with the kitbot frame you already have the frame ready to go where you don't have to worry about designing it before being able to play the game right absolutely um and then gearboxes i, I mean i when i was a student in 2005 i made dewalt <laughs> drill gearboxes they weren't they were interesting to make. Um, so a, a little bit more about that is they, it, it was a, a solution for a problem that existed at the time, mm -hmm. which was the, 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 the transmissions that we got for what were then the drill motors, they, they, the, the standard motor for, for the uh, drivetrain was a drill motor, and most veteran teams will tell you that they burn through a dozen or two dozen drill motors because of these very cheaply made uh, transmissions. And so they, that's why, you know, if, if you've got a drill motor, why not use a drill transmission? So that was kind of the idea behind. Yep. I remember making them. They were very interesting and the <laughs> Animarks uh, options we have now are way cheaper and way easier to use. Absolutely. Um, and with your motor curve, um, how would you recommend teams figuring out if they want to go for a defensive bot or an offensive bot? How do you figure that out on your motor curve? Or, or like how fast do you want the robot to go? Or how much does it want to push kind of thing? Well, like I said, if, if you aim for around 10 feet per second uh, and, and in the kit bot, you, you're going to be right around that, uh, that, that range. Uh, then, then that that's that's what you need to do, and and just play around with your different sprocket sizes. So if if you want it to go a little bit faster, or you want to push a little bit harder, but it really depends on on what the other teams are like in your area. Um, there are some areas of the country that the robots are very defensive, and other areas where they really value the speed over the torque. So it's really um, your trade-offs are between speed, power, or maneuverability, really. Yeah. So it's figuring out which one do you want to do during your competition season. Um, and where do you recommend using planetary gears? Well, 
Planetary uh, gear sets are very useful for getting very large gear ratios. So if, if you want a lot of torque and you want to sacrifice speed, or if you're using a motor that has a very high speed, initial speed, then that's where your planetary gear sets are going to work out the best. And that's actually where, where a lot of uh, the industrial robots end up using uh, variations of planetary gear sets. And with the wheels, we got plenty of different options. I mean, my favorite option is the generic <laughs> Andy Mark ones. Those, those, those are a classic. These, these, are, uh, the, these are really good. Uh, you can also get, I mean, this, this has the aluminum frame, which is uh, a little heavier, a little more durable, but there's nothing wrong with the plastic frames that yep. you can get with these as well. I've only ever broken one of the aluminum ones. So that's that, that, that's an achievement. It is really an achievement. <laughs> it was fun to break it. Um, but going with the speed power maneuverability, um, which gear, which um, wheel you were talking about using the drop down omni wheel, omni directional wheels, mm -hmm. um, with the omni directional drives, how do you, how does an omni directional drive actually work? Well, there, there's a couple of different ways to do it, but they, they all basically. Uh, work on one principle, which is you've got most of your wheels going in your normal direction of travel, and then uh, you either one or more wheels that are facing uh, perpendicular, the opposite, or you know, 90 degrees away from your direction of travel. So whether it drops down or you use a, a omni wheel that, that's able to skid uh, in, 90 degrees away from its normal direction, uh, that, that's how you, you're able to get your different directions. So how does a swerve drive work then? The swerve drive, uh, that's it, that just like a normal car, uh, uh, you, you're, you're turning the wheels and, and you're going in different directions. Uh, but the problem is, is anyone that's had to parallel park their car knows, uh, it's, it's sometimes very challenging to get a very tight turning radius. You, you, you lose that tight turning radius, and uh, you always need to think of where you want to go instead of where you are. OK. Um, so for rookie teams, how do you recommend them start figuring out, just starting from scratch, what do you recommend them to try first? I think six-wheel drive skid steer will work really well. Uh, the advantage to six-wheel drive is your two middle wheels are slightly lower than your outer wheels, which allows you to turn in a very tight turning radius. Uh, the, the standard gearboxes are very well, uh, uh, are very good for, for most applications, and uh, just playing around with those gear ratios. Mm -hmm. And um, to final this out, what do you have any Thoughts about um, the this year's game and how they could what drivetrain might be the best. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I really think that uh, this year is a a skid steer year. Um, there have been other years where there's uh, game objects that you need to really maneuver around and 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 uh, and. Accuracy in position is very important. This is a year where you can be a little more forgiving on accuracy, uh, and you can be uh, and you can put more effort into speed. So, getting those 13 mile an hour robots to get across the field in a couple seconds. Yep. Um, well, thank you for joining us for the, this um, series, and thank you again to Orange County government for sponsoring our series. And again, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. FIRST Robotics Competition is the world's landmark robotics competition for students. In school you read about stuff, but in FIRST as a whole, you actually go and do it. In the beginning of January, the challenge comes out every year. Under strict rules and limited time and resources, you have to design, build, program, and test a robot. There's no blueprint. We get a few rules and guidelines to follow, and then it's up to those students to find something that works. 
there's nothing better than just seeing your robot on the field playing for the first time. They're all there like, is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? And then it works, it's the best feeling ever. You have mentors that are actually in the field that can tell you, oh, this is why this works, and this is the science behind it. And you're like, oh wow, that makes so much sense. They do a great job, not just about STEM, but about life, you know, how to go through college, how to go through, you know, a tough, you know, physics class. At face value, first revised competition is a robot competition, but at the end of the day, it's so much more than that. People ask me, like, oh, you build robots? I said, no, it's, we're really running a business, and all the things that go along with that. We deal with a lot of marketing, social media. I've learned business side of things, problem solving, working in groups. I'm learning how to communicate with people, how to reach out to local businesses. So we kind of have robotics as the starting point, but we branch out to different areas and expand. So the, the ultimate goal every year is always to get to the first championship. The first championship is basically like the Olympic for robots. There's hundreds of teams from all over the world there, and you get to see some of the best teams that exist. It's very competitive, but you're friends with the people that you're going against. It's like a sport, but in its own way, it's better than a sport. Being part of FIRST has really changed my life and you know how I think about myself, how I think about others. Participating in FIRST actually taught me that I'm capable of doing anything that I set my mind to. FIRST has really inspired me to give back in my old elementary school. I'm trying to help their robotics program that just started this year. I want those kids to have the opportunity to learn about STEM. As a participant in the first program in high school, you get access to $80 million worth of scholarships. There are scholarships for colleges, universities, as well as technical programs. It also looks really good on the actual application to be on FIRST. FIRST does a really great job trying to open programs to make sure that you could actually accomplish anything in STEM, no matter where you're from, your background, your language, or anything like that. I really do consider myself part of the STEM community, and I couldn't be more prouder to say that. FIRST Robotics Competition is one of four engaging FIRST programs that shows students unique challenges and helps them learn new engineering skills and real-world skills that'll help them in the future. First is the future. First is accomplishment. First is passion. First is inspiring. First is changing my story.